Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Modern Lending Podcast Live. I'm so excited that you're joining me now here, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, man, I'm, I'm so jazzed about this conversation. Um, I had the privilege of listening to this man speak several times. I've followed him on social media. I've become a huge fan over the years, read his book. We'll get into this. But um, if you don't know Steve Sims, you're in for a treat. Not only because this guy brings truth and just realness and actual like mind-blowing shit, he also gives so much of his time and energy to move the narrative forward across so many different industries. And he's also the modern-day Wizard of Oz. I mean, when you find out what this guy's capable of achieving, I hope it opens up your mind to see what you could possibly do with your life. So without further ado, let's bring on the modern-day Wizard of Oz, Steve Sims. What up, Steve? Hey, how you doing? I heard you compare me to an old pervert that hides behind a curtain, so thank you very much. Well, you know, it's on the internet now, so it's real. You can't hide <laughs> yeah, it. I know. Everybody says it. It's like a thing. Yeah. Uh, I remember Steve when I first got quoted, I was thinking, I'm not much, I'm not really sure I like that, you know, because he, he was a fraud. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll quickly move across that one. You know, although I, I, he does something very special that not people, people don't recognize. My dad pointed this out to me. I didn't realize it. He validates in other people the truth that was always inside them. I'll take that. I'll take I like that. that. Yeah, I like I'll that. take that. Yeah. All right. So, Your dad's a smart man. <laughs> Sometimes. Oh, man. Steve, this is going to be a fun conversation. Um, before we kick off, I have a surprise for everybody that's watching now and in the future. At the bottom, you can see there's a text me number, which is my text community, and a weekly download, which is available at alechanson.com. Or if you just share this video. That's all you got to do. Share it on LinkedIn or Facebook. I'm going to buy you a copy of this book and mail it to you for free because I think this book has something of extreme value, Steve, for everybody, especially in COVID. And I want to talk about all this stuff, but especially with COVID going on, um, man, talk about mindset and opening up new ways to see the world. Thank you for, for this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, one of the things I first want to talk about, uh, we've gotten digital. We've gone digital in our worlds because COVID has restricted our freedoms and everything else. Has put all these th limitations on everybody. You got to wear masks. And I got my mask with unicorns on it to let people know what's up. And one of the things you talk about in your book, and you talk about frequently when you speak all over the place, is the, is the reality of being real, the power of being real. And you say you don't like the word authentic because it turns into a marketing buzz. And then you throw around the word ugly. But I, I love this because there are so many people going digital and what they're doing is they're hiding their true self, in my opinion. And they're putting glamour and glitz on. And I want you to just unpack this. Like, what did you mean when you said this? Um, what do you see for today as local pros and uh, people doing right and wrong? I mean, just open up your insights on this. By the way, if you're live and watching this and you have a comment question, drop it in. We're going to answer it. I appreciate you guys. But Steve, let's start with that. Let's start with being ugly. Well, you've actually just shoved me on a pedestal uh, or on my soapbox, should I say, there, because you, you kicked me off with some rather kind of like, you know, pokey little things. I hate the word authentic because so many people sit there and they go, oh, look at him, look at her. She's so authentic. Mm -hmm. When you say that someone is authentic, you're acknowledging the rest of the planet is not. <laughs> and that's terrible. You know, that, that, that's like me going, oh, Alec, look at him. He's breathing. You know, we should... We should be able to take it for granted that you are who you are. I have a great belief in being transparent. I want people to be transparent. I want people to be um, impossible to misunderstand. I want there to be no hidden agenda. I want the transparency and the crystal clarity of why that person is in front of me. Now, if I've got that, then I'm educated enough to make a decision as to whether or not I want them to stay. So I love transparency over authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, that exactly. hopefully explains that. Yeah. But you talk about today, the dumb thing is that every digital platform we have also comes with a pile of tools to lie about it. Oh, like yeah. you can go on Instagram, you can take a picture of you on the beach and, you know, it's, it's a nice day. But what's the first thing you do? You hit the edit button and you make the sky a little bit blue and you make oh, yeah. the sea a little bit, you know, perfect. And, you know, you can even get these kind of rub out things. So someone down the road's not too pretty. I'm going to rub them out of my picture. They didn't exist. That's not real. The no. bottom line of it is if I go into a pub or if I go into a bar, and I've been into a couple in my life, and I walk up to someone 
I'm not going to edit the person I am. I'm not going to be halfway through the conversation with you, Alec, and then go, oh, what a, oh, sorry, I just messed up my words. Let me walk back here out, and then I'm going to walk back in again, and we'll start that conversation again. Redo it. That's not real life. So when you've got pictures that are not perfect, they're relatable. And believe it or not, you're spending so much time trying to make a picture-perfect uh, picture for your Instagram or something like that, you're actually losing the connection with the audience and the people yeah. that, are, that are watching it. And as I've already said, well, as I've always said on my my, uh, my post and to that, perfection is a blue unicorn with three testicles. It doesn't exist. So just keep it real and relatable and you'll keep people for longer. I think that's just a message people need to continue to hear because I don't see it happening. And And maybe you can go one step deeper though, Steve, because when you talk about being real, and showing up as you are and not editing it and really being present, there's a lot of fear that people have. Fear of being judged, fear of not being enough, fear of, you know, all that, all that stuff, I think, and it's holding people back. How do you, how do you deal with that and coach that and, and experience that? Well, my wife said I had the superhuman power of ignorance. Um, <laughs> and so for, for many, many years, for many, many years, I didn't care. Um, Literally, I didn't care. Then you do start to worry. You do get concerned and you do the stupid thing. You start to concern yourself with what the other person is interpreting of you. Mm -hmm. That's a calculation that Elon Musk can't even work out. So don't even start on that. Also, social has given us a, a given us proof that everybody else's life is prettier than ours. <laughs> You've never, ever seen a picture. And please don't do this. You've never seen a picture of anyone on the toilet or picking a spot or opening up a, a, a bill or I you know, like put an asterisk, like, please don't actually do please this. Please don't do this. Um, the Kardashians probably will at some point, but you know, they don't care. Um, but that's real life. We know it happens. We know it real, but we don't show it. So what we do see is people leaning up against cars that they don't own. Yes. People walking onto jets and doing a selfie. There's 400 <laughs> people behind them, and they've just jumped themselves in the first class seat, and then they're told to move, but they got the picture first. And so we're being we're being infiltrated with fakeness. Yeah, it also intimidates us. And the trouble is, a lot of people now they don't want to show up. They are frightened to show up. But when you show up, as the old saying goes, warts and all, again. You're relatable. You're yeah. real. There's no agenda. But there was a time in my life that I actually doubted me. Now, believe it or not, I've always had piercings, tattoos, and no hair. But there <laughs> was a time when um, I got concerned. Mm. Nine years into doing what I was doing, working with some of the richest, most powerful people in the planet, that I literally got concerned and I bought some suits and I bought a car. Oh. And I realized. I bought the car to impress you. I was wearing the suits to impress you. I bought I bought a watch that was the price of a new Range Rover to impress you. Yeah. Okay. And it wasn't me. And luckily, um, luckily, I realized it quick enough, got rid of it all, went back to the black T-shirt and jeans. But when you turn up as you and when you're prepared to go, hey, this is it, it makes the person's decision in front of you easier. Mm-hmm. The second you try to twist yourself to get to work with that person, to laugh at the jokes that aren't funny, you know, as soon as you start doing that, yeah, that's when you sell yourself out. And if you can't connect with someone in a true, real basis, then surprise, surprise, I hate to break it up, you haven't connected with them at all. You know, I love this message because as salespeople, we become chameleons to a degree or we're taught like build rapport, shadow, match, you know, use similar language and all these things and tricks of like the 80s to like line up to somebody and make sure you can get the best impression. And I, and to your point, they're, they're hiding their true self. And all of a sudden, when you get around a group of people, they don't know who to chameleon themselves about anymore because now there's too many people to, to, to mix with. Yeah, and they, they don't know how to handle it. And I had a similar experience in my career. I did the same thing. So I, I resonate with it 100%. And as soon as you find and, and, there's so much freedom in just going, this is who I am. And then by the way, guys, it attracts the same, those customers that want that, which is the ideal customer you want anyway. Yeah, It Steve, does. It does. The one, the one thing I realized was, and I, I saw, I saw we got Bill Hart that's jumped on here. Bill's oh a superstar. I love Bill. 
Um, big shout out to Bill. As soon as the uh, as soon as COVID's over, boy, my house, samurai swords, old fashions. Um, but uh, and Alec, you'll have to come up because you bought me a fantastic bottle of whiskey. So you'll have to come up and share that. Um, as soon as you realize the amount of effort it doesn't take to be you, you're energized to actually work on the client you're dealing with. When I suddenly found out that, you know, it, it doesn't take any effort to be this good looking, you know, I only have black T-shirts because I don't have to think. Pull a black T-shirt out. Actually, funny enough, my wife was ironing some of my shirts the other day. And she went, they're starting to look a little bit gray. So I got rid of them and we've ordered four new black T-shirts. It's just a simple life. No effort, no energy on yourself. That's the way it should be. And Bill's, Bill's just like that. Bill is Bill wherever he is. 100%. Um, and so it makes it easy for people to look at Bill and go, well, I resonate with Bill, but I don't resonate with Steve Sims. And you know the beauty? is that that's fine. That's absolutely, there's billions of people in the planet. If I only get to work with half a percent of those, you know, I'm doing fine. Yeah. Well, and it's funny too. One of my sayings these days is that everyone has their own neat, unique audience and they're all just waiting for you to show up. If you look mm. at all the, um, it, 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 just how people think and how they view the world, there's somebody that wants to hear it from that perspective. And yeah. I don't necessarily want to hear it from my perspective. And I, I love that. So, okay, I want to pivot a little bit. Okay. Because one of the things that has blown my mind when I first got exposed to you, Steve, was just your ability to do things that I thought were impossible. So I, I want to ask you, I mean, because do you have a favorite thing that you pulled off for somebody that maybe it never could have been pulled off or they thought or maybe you even had your own doubts, even though you probably don't let that show? That like, oh, man, I wonder if I could make that happen that you actually did for somebody. I mean, like the, the married at the Vatican, like the Titanic, like the, the story in your book about the journey, uh, the band journey and the guy that, I mean, I'm like, how? how does this stuff happen? So can I give you a story? I want one. I was working in Rome and you've already mentioned it. I was actually getting a couple married in the Vatican by the Pope. And Which so you I know, was, like you do, <laughs> like you do, you know, and I was in Rome and I was there for like six months. Yeah. Um, and one of my clients knew I was in Rome. So he contacted me and he said, I have to go down to Florence. I'm taking my fiance and mum and dad. And for anyone that's heard this story, stick with it because there's an ending you may not have heard. There's an additional story to answer Alex's question. So they contacted me because they wanted a, he wanted a dining experience to impress his future mother-in-law and father-in-law. The word experience was in there. So everyone is scared of doing the impossible. Yeah. I'm scared of giving the client what he asked for. Because the second that you give the client what he asked for, you've completed the transaction. You <laughs> become a McDonald's drive through you become Amazon. Yep. If you don't think Amazon is a transactional service, phone them up and ask them what's the best toilet roll you should be buying this week. <laughs> they can't do it, okay? Yeah. So I created, and I'll skip through, I created an experience by always, always, always starting at the top and even if I fail, I far exceed what the client asked for. So I tried to get the Academia de Galleria, which is the museum, Florence's museum that houses Michelangelo's David. I gave them the idea of having a dinner set up for six people at the feet of Michelangelo's David to create the world's greatest Italian meal. And I don't know By how way, so we get into that. I know. So I had my 10th anniversary with my wife in Italy. And I know I've, I've been in this museum. I stood right where this table stood. I know right. exactly what you're talking about. So keep All going. Right. So I got them to close the museum at three o'clock in the afternoon, kick everyone out, give it to me an entire museum until two o'clock in the morning. Okay. And I had a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, a string quartet, a piano, and then halfway through the pasta, I brought in Andrea Bocelli to serenade them while they were finishing their meal. Okay. Now that's wonderful, but I want to skip to something else that happened that night that actually has been more impactful on my life. So I was dealing with the top people, the biggest supporters, the biggest sponsors of this museum that were making some phone calls to get me the credibility to get the museum shut down. Yeah. There was a curator in there. Now, the curator's on payroll. He's looking at every piece of art as his baby. He understands every single, you know, nuance to every single piece in there. And there's this guy in a black T-shirt with an eyebrow piercing and tattoos 
wandering in with a fancy dancy client that doesn't understand it you can imagine the curator is less than happy about me being there but his bosses are telling him you look after mr sims so here's the story every time i needed anything everyone else was yes 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 yep he gave me attitude he gave me friction he was always like i i will see I knew you had to do it. So don't tell me you're going to see. Get it done. You know, I didn't say that, but he gave me friction. He wanted it to be clear in his tone that he didn't really want to be, you know, working with me. Mm -hmm. So in the evening, before my client was going to turn up, which was nine o'clock, Andrea and Veronica, Veronica's his wife, and Andrea Bocelli's son was the pianist. It was the full Bocelli family there. Incredible. Yeah. Oh, it. It was. It was one of the most, it was one of my favorite events I've ever done. Okay. While Andrea is literally, and this is what they were doing, they would sing a bit. Yeah. And then move the piano about 10 feet to make sure there was no reverb or any kind of echo. Okay. And then, of course, when you move a piano, you've got to retune the bloody thing again. So mm -hmm. they were dancing this piano all around in front of the, uh, or slightly to the left of David to get the best sound. While this is going on, I'm leaning up against a column, looking at the beautiful table set up, okay? Looking at Andrea, checking out his tone and his vocal cords, looking at his son playing around the piano, chatting with Veronica, chatting with a few of the other people that are there. The curator is leaning against the other wall, okay, watching it as well. Mm -hmm. He had given me friction for about 72 hours. And this is where the little prick in me came out, the selfish little bastard. I thought to myself, I'm going to give him a little bit of a dig. I'm going to be a bully. And for anyone out there going, well, that's rude. That's what, yes, it is. But it came out in me. My little yeah. evil monster came out. And I just wanted to give him a little jab just to let him know that, hey, you tried to give me friction, but I still got this pulled off. <laughs> so I called him. And, you know, he turned around and I, you know, said, hey, come here, come here. So he came over, arms crossed, not wanting to have anything to do with me, not wanting to be, you know, post friends or anything like that. And um, he's got his arms crossed and he's looking very Italian, very dapper, very sharp. Again, I'm in a black T-shirt and jeans. Yeah. Um, and he's looking at all of this. So I said to him, hey, look at that, Andrea Bocelli, you know, just warming up. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And without looking at me, he went, yes, yes, it is, it is. I said, look at that table. That table is beautiful. It had the, the candelabras on there, and it was this beautiful gold, you know, silk uh, table. It was a beautiful spread, as you would expect for something to this standard. Um, it was probably a $100,000 table just in all yeah. the settings on it. Oh my God. I'm like, and look at that table. That's but He's like, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. I said, look, this is all at the feet of Michelangelo's day, we got Andrea Bocelli and a meal. Can you believe that? And he's like, no, no, no. And I was getting all of the, the affirmations out of him. And I thought, keep them coming because I'm just about to slap you in the Tuesday. So I turned around and I said to him, so I wonder how come I was able to pull it off. And this was where I was expecting him to go, because no one's as connected as you, Mr. Sims. No one's as smooth and debonair. I just wanted him to eat, you know? And I was like, come on, come on. Yep. The little bastard just turned around and he went, no one's ever asked. And I was floored. It absolutely killed me. And I was like, no, oh, but it got me thinking. You see, the trouble is, as soon as you put the word impossible, in any conversation, you've already allowed yourself never to achieve it. It's impossible for me to do a four-minute mile. It's impossible for me to lose weight. It's impossible for me to get someone married in the Vatican by the Pope. I'd never use the word impossible. And the second you do, you own up to the point that you're never going to achieve it. When he told me this, and to, to complete it a bit, I then he realized he'd killed me. And that was the first time I bloody saw him smile a little bit. Um, we actually went out afterwards and we are actually dear friends. I was supposed to visit him at his home this year, but it couldn't happen. So he got the one up on me there. But you know, when I came back to the States, I phoned up the people in Pentagon. I phoned up the people that I'd worked with in Harvard. I'd phoned up all these different things. And I said to him, Hey, I'm just, just catching up. We haven't spoken. I wanted to ask you, 
Why did this happen? And every single one of them turned around and said, well, no, you know, no one had ever asked or, you know, we'd, we'd never been requested to do this or you, you were the first one that ever, you know, came to. And it suddenly made me realize that my ignorance had never allowed me to put that word impossible in there. So if you do, and I love it because people come to me and they go, oh, yeah, I want to do this, Steve, but it's impossible. And I'm myself that it's unachievable. OK, yep. in your mind, it can't be done. That's not my mind. See, this is this this is what I want people to hear right now because you know, Steve, we're in this environment where we're feeling like things are impossible. It, I can't do business the way I used to do business because COVID has restricted this, or it's too hard, or now I can't do this, or I can't get on video and build digital influence because that's a millennial thing and I don't understand it, and that's that's it's too hard or it's impossible. And your mindset throughout this entire book, the bluefish mindset, is that. It's not impossible. And exactly what you just said, remove the word. And so for, we're, we're 20 minutes in and some people are just probably joining now. And there's this thing at the bottom of the screen right there that says text my community number or join the weekly download on alichanson.com or just share this video to bring impact into somebody else's life. And I'm going to mail you a copy of Blue Fishing for free. Just mail it to you because this book has nuggets like this all throughout it. And so Steve, what else can you share on this topic of impossible? Because there are people right now whose mindsets are struggling. And, and by the way, as you probably know, there's loans falling from the sky. And so there's re record low rates. There's some crazy you know, fulfillment and capacity issues across our industry. So there's a lot of distraction. And that distraction is stopping people from doing the things they know they should be doing. And they're well, falling down on their excuses. I'm going to call out bullshit, okay? And I'm actually going to put my hands up and say COVID is one of the best things that's ever happened to us, okay? <laughs> And, and people are going to be like, oh, you can't be saying that. Well, sorry, honey, just did. <laughs> the bottom line of it is we're pissed off now. And as you say, we're, we're distorted, we're distracted, we're, con we're confused, we don't have clarity. We don't have any of these things because when will COVID be over? And what's COVID done to us? It's done one thing, stopped us connecting with other human beings. Rates are low. I still need a home. My lights are still going on. I still want to chat with people, but I can't connect with people. Well, I hate to break your bubble and rain on your parade, but we started this shit in 2000 when we invented Friendster and MySpace. We've yeah. been socially distancing since the early 2000s, and now it's just come to a head. And I'm pleased as fuck that you hate missing it. I want people, when COVID's over, to suddenly realize that, hey, I'm the one that's been distancing myself away from true connection. I'm the one that's been filtering my pictures a little bit more to make myself look a little bit more appealing and pretty. I'm going to come back and I'm going to, for the first time in probably 20 years, I'm going to show up. And this is going to be me. If it loses me clients, eh, they weren't clients. They were paychecks. Okay. So I want people to be irritated now on what you're missing. I want you never to forget this pain, and I want you to focus on connecting. Now, the tough thing is we're missing out on it now, but it's not gone. And Bill Hart will, will, will be able to kind of, you know, quote you on this. I have found very creative ways because we're creative people. See, Amazon doesn't think, create, and dream. It, it transacts. Yep. The second, as, as Dave Savage says, we've got to do everything Amazon does and everything it doesn't do. And that is create, disrupt, design, dream, desire. We've got to be able to do those. If you use those brain cells, you can still find creative ways to connect with people. Well, and I'm all about connect. Let's talk about, let's talk about a creative thing I saw on social that you did. Let's talk about, let's talk about Christmas cards in July. Oh. I, saw, I saw you do, do this. I saw it. And I was like, what is he doing? So well, the, what, daft, what thing, the daft thing is, we are all, we're all gagging for the connection, okay? Yeah. We're all desperate to get out and connect with people. So we've got our arms out wanting it. Now, here's the dumb thing. Have you noticed your TV adverts are really bad at the moment? Because all of the advertisers are scaling back. Well, hang on a minute. People want to receive warmth, understanding, connectivity, relate. They want you to solve their problems. Yet the rest of the planet is deciding it's a bad time to advertise. 
That is an oxymoron that I can't get my head around. If people are looking at connecting now, surely we should be doubling down on the ways that we do it. Yeah. So one of the things that I did, and you never ever do what is expected. That will yeah. never light up anyone's toes. So what I did was, um, and I've done this for a few years. I've done this for about six years. Okay. Um, I sent out Christmas cards. Now, here's one little tip for you. I bet you didn't know this, but Christmas cards in July are actually cheaper than they are in December. Well, the shocking. <laughs> shocking, isn't it? I knew that was going to blow people away. So I saved my ass on actually being able to buy 250 Christmas cards. And then what I did was I wished in, in the card just simply, Bill, Merry Christmas, Steve, and I posted it. <laughs> now, the beautiful thing is how many fingers does it take to delete an email? One. All right. How I mean, many I have all spam right. blockers on, and I don't, it takes me no filter. It just gets deleted. All right. How many fingers does it take to open up an envelope? You got to use your whole hand. You use your own your whole hand or both hands? Well, yeah, you got to hold it, and yeah, then you got to exactly. grip it or drive a so knife through it. It's like something. holding a steering wheel, isn't it? I've yeah. got your total bodily commitment. You can't be drinking a cup of coffee while opening up my envelope. You physically can't. Do it. I do this on stage, and you always get someone go, it takes one, and I give them an envelope, and I go, there you go. Open that with one finger. Watch so, them. Yeah, watch them look a little bit kind of like, you know, I can't use the words I want to use, but they look a bit stupid. Um, so the bottom line of it is I sent out Christmas cards in July. Yeah. People were compelled because Christmas cards you come, usually come in square envelopes. Anything that's a square envelope is an invite. Psychologically, we always recognize it. That it's an it's an invite, okay? If it's got a window box on it with your name perfectly typed, you know it's a bill. But if it's handwritten and it's square, you think it's an invite. The anticipation, the excitement. How many of you out there get excited whenever Amazon drops off a box? Oh, dude, the dopamine hit, right? The, uh, absolutely. You know it's freaking toilet duck to unblock your sink because you <laughs> bloody ordered it. But you're still excited when you're ripping open that box and go, yay, great, I've got my tampons, excellent, you know, and you got a little excited. So when you get that envelope, you don't know why it's there, but you recognize it as anticipation. You recognize it as an invite. Then you recognize it with Christmas. These are all triggers that make you smile because everyone smiles on their birthday for an invite, getting a special little gift, Christmas Day. You, So I've got you smiling. And then what I did was I used a QR code that sent you to a video. And in this video, it was like, hey, I wanted to get you that card because I wanted to be the first one to get you a Christmas card this year. That's how special you are. So they got me. But then I went into why I sent it and how as a market employee, you should be doing it with all your people. So not only did I do something to make you smile, which you won't forget, come Christmas, how many of my people are going to think, well, Steve got there first? Yeah. You know? So it, it's always, I've had people in past years actually save that and put it on their mantelpiece and gone, well, Steve's was the first one I got this year because it was in July, you know? So the bottom line of it is I've sent mugs. I've sent little, um, I sent out a load of little booklets. And these booklets had uh, um, great ideas I've had while I've been drunk or, you know, um, uh, stupid decision, uh, stupid ideas. Okay, I love that one because all ideas start off with stupid just before they're genius. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I would send out these little books and I'd go, Look, what else have you got to do today other than binge watch Netflix or come up with some stupid ideas that are going to change the world? And so, you're showing your care. And the dumb thing is, these pads that were like nine dollars posted, okay. Because it's COVID and everyone wants to make money, I was getting them at $3 a piece, including postage. Hey, Mikey, throw up the link to the Facebook community. So, Steve, one of the things you do is you host a community on Facebook. I do. Uh, and, and talk about it because I'm a part of it. I think it's a great way you add value to the, to the world. What, what's your intent with this group? Uh, to make you smarter, make you more impactful, and uh, get you out of your own way. Um, we came up with this group. It's free of charge, no promoting, no selling, no negativity, no bullshit. And what we do is we go in there and I talk about, hey, I'm trying this program at the moment for my LinkedIn messages. Um, mm -hmm. It's really So I reveal 
all the technology that I'm trying and if it works or it doesn't work. And so I think next Wednesday, so if, and again, it's free of charge. If everyone jumps in there um, and just registers for that group and then yep. we'll approve you, we're actually doing a live AMA next, I think it's Wednesday, where mm -hmm. I'm actually going through the results of what me sending out 250 Christmas cards did and the back end, the actual dashboard of all the stuff that people don't realize I've been able to accumulate by sending out these things. It looks funny. It looks quirky. But the data you can grab today is almost scary. Um, and I reveal what I do. And so this is a way of me being able to go, hey, I'm trying this. really works for you to be able to try it with your people. And you can. Just imagine if all the people that you were working with and all the prospects you sent out a Christmas card. You know, they would be, they would be shocked. They would yeah. be confused, okay? Yeah. But a confused mind is receptive to the next message you give it. And so if it's one of thought, connection, <clears throat> just to say, hey, <clears throat> we're in strange times. What's stranger than a Christmas card in August? Yep. Enjoy yourself. I saw people putting up their Christmas lights. <laughs> yeah. Christmas light. Why not? Why not? Yeah, just, yeah, like, just have fun. Yeah. Well, see, if you said something profound that I think is going to get skipped over because you've said a lot of profound things today. So thank you, by the way. I'm getting tons of like my texts are blowing up of people are like, I guess I have to close down my podcast after this. So you're the final guest because I can't go up any higher. So this is it. Ooh. Thanks for that. But well, have you, you had Bill Hart yet? Yeah, oh yeah. Bill was last week. Oh, well, there you go. Yes, I'm surprised I was. A, I'm, his, I'm his after warm up act. <laughs> Post warm up. But here's what you said. You said every idea starts out stupid until yeah. it's cheap. And, and some of the things you were talking about in your group is just you're trying this, you're doing this, you're experimenting with this. And you talk a lot about that in your book too. And I've seen you talk a lot about it. But so many people are afraid to try something stupid in fear of looking stupid. I'm going to name drop that's going to annoy people, but that's what I do. Um, a few years ago, I was doing a private tour. This was pre-NASA, a private tour of Elon Musk's SpaceX down in Hawthorne. OK, I had 60 of quite simply the richest people in the planet. They owned telecoms. They owned gas companies. You know, the head of Verizon, all of these people were coming along to this event. And I was taking um, Elon to meet the crowd. But I had two of my clients with me and they wanted to walk with me so they could walk with Elon Musk. Yeah, okay. One of them was happily quiet, just happy to be walking down you know, through SpaceX with Elon Musk. The other one was like a little child at a Justin Bieber concert that just wanted to get into a conversation with Elon Musk for any reason and was yeah, like, please. so when, when did you do that? What do you think about that? Oh, did you like, the guy's a billionaire, but he was just busting a gut over Elon Musk. And he turned around. And again, this was pre-NASA signing SpaceX, okay? And NASA at the time, if you recall, were actually publicly dissing Elon oh, yeah. I remember saying that there's no space for the public se spe um, sector in yep. space. Yep. You know, this is a government agency. Know your lane was one <laughs> of the things that they said, okay, because he was into Tesla cars. Um, and so my client turned around, and I don't know why. He was just trying to get a conversation going. And Elon's not very conversational. You know, if you no. know much about him, he's oh, not. I know. My brother yeah, no, he's not. So my client turned around and go, oh, and what about NASA? NASA's, you know, publicly dissing it. You know, are, are you bothered about that? Elon didn't even look at him, but I remember these words. Elon turned around and said, they will always laugh at you before they applaud. And that was the only thing he said. And I was like, damn, that's good. And the amount of people that I know, Ray Kurzweil, Pia Diamandis, people that have done shockingly brilliant things they were openly mocked seconds before it was revered as genius. Man, I hope everybody hears that because it's the truth. Now, Steve, you also have a distillery program that you invite people in to go one step deeper with you. And there's a link that I'm going to put on the screen, too, because it's fact. It's it's fa not only are you giving away free stuff, but then you have a deeper dive, which I think is amazing. What's your what's your vision for this for your distillery program? Well, the Sims Distillery is basically you commit, I commit. Um, so I want to help people out in a Facebook group. I get in there as much as I can, but there seems to still be. You're in there all the time. You're dropping value all the time. And I like to, you know, and yeah. I believe today, 
I believe today we need to, we need that support. And we're all, we're all creative disruptors. If, Cause if you're not disrupting, you're being disrupted. And so COVID isn't, Hey, COVID is a sport. Would you like to come and play bollocks? You're in the game. You're playing. <laughs> you're playing. It depends playing. on how you play or whether you go and cry your eyes out on the bench. We're in this game. The bell's been called and we're running around chasing that ball. We need as much support as we can get. So the Facebook group gives that support. The Sims Distillery, you get me. So I actually bring in my experts, you know, the Jeffrey Madoffs, the Jay Abrahams. Um, i got Jim Quick coming up. i got Joe Polish. i got um, Billy Jean. Dan Fleischman's been in there. So we do live AMAs in there, which just like this, you guys actually get to ask, like the producer of Victoria's Secrets and Ralph Lauren, how best to build up a video using your iPhone. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to ask the most amazing things. Tucker Max, how can I do a book? Jim Quick, how can I rehearse and, and get to keep my mind smarter? All of these things, you get to converse with these people. So Sims Distillery is uh, my way of asking you to commit. And when I get people commit and walk in there, then I unload everything. And everything that I do that I don't tell everyone about, I tell everyone in Sims Distillery. I, I want to go here, Steve. We get, we're hitting the, we're coming closer to the forty minute mark. I know you have a lot of stuff, and I know you're getting heading to Vegas, and you got your pack day for you. So <laughs> On a motorbike. <laughs> but this is where I want to, I want to kind of land this, the rocket ship we've been on, because we hit so many powerful conversations that could turn into hours of discourse in, you know, the thirty six minutes we've been talking. But this is where I want to kind of come in, because you've said some really core stuff about. The, the desire we have to connect with other human beings. And then in your book, as someone comes to you and talks to you, you ask three whys. Mm. And I love that as kind of the final conversation piece. And by the way, if you're in the comments and you want to have a, ask Steve something like he's here, like that, do it. Like if you're watching this in the future, sorry, but if you're watching it now, you can ask him a question, but you, you ask three whys. And I think that's a really great conversation to how do we create better connection with others? And I can also give you a perfect story about it as well from a realtor client that I was coaching. And we actually went into the why um, section for her uh, future and her business. Yeah, so right. I actually go, I, I believe you tap into your inner Sherlock. Okay. So when someone comes to you and they ask you a question, ten, ten, nine times out of 10, I was going to say 10 times out of 10. So I'll stick with that. 10 times out of 10, people are scared to tell you what they really want. Yes. They dilute it a little bit so they don't sound silly. You know, and so they will pull back a little bit. If you ask someone, hey, you want a a billion dollars, what would you do this weekend? They'll be like, oh, I'd get a mansion and Lamborghinis and I'd have a hot tub party with, you know, Hawaiian tropic girls. It's a knee jerk reaction. If you say to them, okay, six months later, what would you do? They may repair their old school. They may do something for their old person's home that their mum was in. You know, now you get into the core of the reason. So I had this realtor that contacted me, and she said that I, I need to talk to you about a very difficult client, okay? There's n- never really difficult clients, they're difficult conversations or diff- difficult understandings. So I said, okay, work me through it. So she said that they had come to her, and they wanted a three-bedroom property on this street. Okay. And I said, fine. So, you know, what did you do? She said, well, I gave them everyone that was available. I said, so you just – you know, basically just turkey shooting them with everything. There you go. And she went, well, you know, they wanted this. So I gave them this. And as I said right at the beginning of this podcast, never give anything, that, never give uh, what the person asks for. Give them what they desire, lust, and need. Okay? So I said, did you ever dare to ask the client why? And they go, oh, no, no, no. Now, the funny thing is, why is still today one of the most confrontational, rude words out there. And mm. I love it. People mm-hmm. say, hey, Steve, I'd love to take you out for a drink. I go, why? I want to know why. You know, it's not supposed to be rude, but I want to be educated. So I said, what you want to do is, because none of the properties were lying her bells, go back to the client and say, hey, I've sent you all of these things. Let's go back. You want to be in this area. And she said, yeah, yeah. She said, why? Not what you're looking for. Why do you want to be in this area? Yep. It turns out that she grew up about 10 miles away 
And back when she was growing up, this street was where all the movers and shakers lived. And her mum used to drive her down this street going, oh, if I won the lottery, this is where I'd move to. So subconsciously, this woman wanted to complete that. Now, we all know that the it street of 20 years ago, maybe he's looking a bit ragged around the, the, the rings now. And yeah. it's the new area where the up and coast. So what she was looking for was an arrival of her now status rather than a zip code. So yeah. she had to reframe <laughs> what the desire was. And I've got one that may make you cry because sadly it makes me cry every single time. Uh, I'll try not to. And I'm thankful this is a podcast and so no one can see it in any case. Oh, they're seeing it on video too. They're going to they're gonna see you cry. Oh, bollocks. Let me turn the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the camera off. Yeah, turn the camera off. I had a client of mine. Sorry, rephrase that. I had a gentleman contact me. Mm. He was not a client, never became a client. And this year, 2020, I finished my last year working with Sir Elton John. And so I'd had a long relationship with him, like eight years. And this guy contacted me and he said, hey, I want to go to Sir Elton John's uh, Oscar party in Hollywood, and I want to meet Elton John, and I want to get a picture. So I said to him, oh, that's great. Why do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. And he went, well, you know, he's uh, an icon. He's brilliant. He's one of the last living legends, and he's going to die soon, so I want to make sure I get a photograph with him. That was it. So I said, oh, that sounds great. Uh, let me see what they say, and I'll come back to you. And, of course, I did him. A month later, we got a phone call come into the office, and one of my girls grabbed it, and she put it through to me, and she said, this sounds like that guy huh. that phoned up a month ago. Yeah. I got a funny idea. It's his mate trying to get it because you, you know, blocked him and wouldn't come back to him. She said, you know, and I don't know how to handle it. I went, put it through to me. So we all believed that this was a mate of yep. the other guy. Yep. Okay. So this guy gets on the phone. He's like, hey, how you doing? Same enthusiasm. And you usually have that enthusiasm when you're asking for something to overcome the embarrassment of either not getting it or someone mm -hmm. laughing at what your dream is. Yep. All right. So I'm used to that psychology there. So the guy's like, hey, yeah, yeah, I'd love to get a photograph with Sir Elton John. So I said, oh, that's great. Why? And as Chris Voss says, I always go into my midnight DJ, you know, why do you want that? You know, you <laughs> calm it down. So he goes quiet for a bit. The other guy didn't. So this guy does. This guy goes quiet. And he says, still quiet. Well, he's a, he's a legend. He's great. He's fantastic. He's an all-star icon. Uh, th there's things. There's things. Th yeah. It was the tone of voice. And it was the there's things. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, tell me about those things. Again, goes quiet. And then he says this. He says, when I was a kid, my dad used to take me to school. And he used to pick me up from school. Never missed a day. It wasn't my mum's thing. It was my dad's thing. Me and my dad, every single day of my school, all the way through into high school before I got a car, he would take me to school, take me back from school. And the first car that we had, had a cassette jammed in there. We couldn't eject it, but it was Elton John. And we used to sing Elton John on the way to school, and we used to sing Elton John on the way back from school. And when he got a new car, it had a CD player. And he bought Elton John's greatest hits. And we used to sing Elton John there, and Elton John, never anything else. He said, even in my teen years going into school, even when I refused to sing, and would stare out of the world, uh, stare out of the window with dire embarrassment. <laughs> My dad would be singing his lungs out to Elton John on the way to school and on the way back. Never, ever failed. He said, now, my dad's been dead yeah. about 20 plus years. When I'm driving to a meeting and Elton John comes on the radio, for the next three minutes, my dad sat next to me. And I want to say thank you to him for bringing my dad back for three minutes every now and then. Now, when I heard that, there was nothing I could do. We got him to meet Elton John. He went out. I can see your eyes there, Alec. Don't make out your tongue. I can see him well in. I introduced them to, and I'd already told them the story. They hugged it out, and the guy told Elton, 
And it was everyone around, big and small, we were blubbering. It was such, it was such a perfect why that it could be achieved. If we hadn't have got to that why, I may have dissed him off like the first guy, and he would have never been able to tell to tell out on how proud he was for bringing his dad back alive. You know, I want to, I, I, Steve, thank you for going into this part of the conversation as we get to the end of this because. There are so many mortgage professionals right now as interest rates are so low and loans are falling from the sky that they're not asking the whys, they're becoming order takers. Mm -hmm. And they have a chance in their career to ask the three whys and not only differentiate themselves from everybody else who's just throwing rates out and interest rates out, but to make human connection with a customer that could be their customer, let alone their friend, for the rest of their career in mortgage. And I, I love the stories of the wise. I, I, that Elton John story is in, intense. Thanks for that. But mm. I think it's the right way to end this because that's how you make life meaningful, even in a, as a mortgage sales guy. You, know, you tap into the, the why of the people you're serving and you can make huge impact. If you are asking the why with your client and then solving the problem that they have, how ready are they going to be to actually refer you to someone that's now got that same problem? If you offer a transaction, if a new company comes up tomorrow called Bing Bong and it sells toilet roll and everything else Amazon does for one cent cheaper, how loyal are you going to be to Amazon? You're not because Amazon has only ever done a transaction with you. You're going to go wherever the thing is that you can get just as easy but cheaper. <clears throat> There's no discount in the price. Now, I've always said, if, you're, if you find yourself arguing over the price, that's because you failed to demonstrate the value. None of the stories I've given you, none of the times I've told you about my clients, none of the times has a client ever, ever, ever welshed on the amount of money it was going to cost them because I demonstrated a value that made it, it made it demonstrate a bargain to them straight off the back because I went in to the core and to the why. Yeah. Brother, I know you got a big day ahead of you. I know you got a big bike ride ahead of you out to the yeah. desert. For those of you guys that are getting value from hanging out with Steve today, just know that he's in his Facebook community. He's in his distillery. He's given this value all the time to everybody around him. Steve, thank you for all you do, my friend. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, all you peeps out there, be good and do something different. Ladies and gentlemen, if this brought you value, share, text me, or join the weekly download on alecanson.com, and I'm going to mail you this book. Steve, God bless my friend. And that's, that's it. The Modern Learning Podcast. I'll see you guys next week. 